I'm James Just, and this is Libertarian Counterpoint. Tonight with me I have Brandon Nelson, um, Northern Area Coordinator for the California Libertarian Party, and Tyler Kuski, a candidate for El Dorado Supervisor. That's correct. So Tyler, why are you running for your campaign? Um, well, you know, I, I got a lot of things, a lot of reasons, but uh, you know, if Ella County is, is such a small rural county, and, and uh, a lot of times, a lot, way back in the day, Ella County used to be a very wealthy county. Um, and it became a retirement county. Uh, and it's because a lot of the restrictions that California did uh, outlawed all the jobs out there. So no one works in LA County. Everyone lives in LA County, but no one works there. I live in LA County, I love LA County, I will be in LA County to the day I die, but the problem is I have to work in, in, in Sac County because that's where all the jobs are. There's no jobs, all the jobs left. Uh, and that's what happened when they outlawed all the mining and when they outlawed all, all the lumber. Uh, so one of the things I, I think that we can that we have an opportunity is recently uh, Congress and Trump administration had uh, legalized hemp farming and cannabis is slowly becoming uh, legal as well. I think that Ella County is primed to, to be a, a cannabis industry. Uh, and, and right now the uh, current um, supervisors had put in extra restrictions after California legalized cannabis. They put in extra restrictions uh, outlawing uh, recreational sales and, and stuff. Uh, there's still you can buy it buy it medically but you can't buy recreational uh, cannabis and I, I think that that that's an, uh, against capitalism and you're, you're, you're basically working against the system but why why are you creating this this communist regime where you can control what businesses are allowed to do here we already have not enough we're already struggling to get businesses and jobs in LA County we need to bring bring those jobs here we need to bring those jobs back we need to make LA County great again I mean, yeah. that's, that's a nutshell of it. Yeah, and it's it's it seems kind of kind of crazy where you, the system where we're going to outlaw um, recreational cannabis, but we're going to allow medical cannabis when anybody on the planet can get a medical ID. It's, it's yeah. essentially. It's, and, 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 now I'm going to clarify. <laughs> uh, now recreational use is legal, but the uh, the, sale, the business sales of it. So you can't open up a dispensary yeah. and sell it to for recreational. You can only sell it for. Uh, medical use. Yeah, but anybody on the planet can get a, a medical you can card. Go, yeah, you go down the street. And it's you, fifty it's, bucks uh, and online. You don't even have to go to the doctor. You're just losing money because what is happening is they're just just causing people to uh, drive not that far, probably a couple miles down the road over to Sac County and buy it over there. And so now Sacramento is getting all the money, and we're not. We're losing. We're giving up. We're giving up our money. We're giving up tax dollars that we can use to build our to fix our roads. I mean, we have a huge road problem. There's potholes everywhere. The county says they're going to work on it. They've never been able to fix the roads. Every time they do, they always cut corners and they always screw it up. You know, like if you if you want to fix the roads, bring the businesses back first. Then you can more, then you can tackle the roads. Don't try to fix the roads with no money. You gotta have money. Yeah, and especially if you're forcing your money to go out of county, it's the money in your county, and you're forcing it out. It makes kind of makes yeah. no sense at all. Well, it, and that, and also all of the jobs that you could get from production sales by having it within the county. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think that even just if we just did hemp farming, not not necessarily the cannabis thing, but just doing the farming. Uh, for, for you know the, all the uses that the hemp has, and especially since it's now uh, fe legal federally, federally to do hemp farming, uh, that would be a perfect starter point. And then as you know, cannabis becomes legal federally, then then we can merge into that thing. But right right now, do, let's focus on the hemp. Let's let's get the, oh, yeah. does the farming done. Let's get some jobs. We can't do lumber. We can't do mining, but we can we can do hemp farming. Let's do that. One of the things I thought, you know, I live in the ghetto. One of the things I thought we should have done is, you know, at the beginning of this whole marijuana legalization, we should have turned, you know, Stocking Boulevard into a marijuana development zone, so we could have had processing centers and and warehouses and those kind of things into the ghetto. But I want to talk to you a minute about this running for candidate. You know, a lot of people don't understand what it's like. I would think maybe we can get a chance for other people who might be interested in running for, for candidate. Yeah. What's it like to go through the process to decide to run for, um, for office? You know, I, I, I'll be honest, I was a little timid about wanting to run at, at first. I, I, I think as a libertarian, I naturally have this uh, this gut reaction to like, no, I don't want to work for the government. <laughs> I, I enjoy my, my, my current job. Uh, I work in the tech industry, and I actually love my job. I get to do sales and tech engineering at the same time, but like, um, I, you know, it, 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 to ha want to go get a job in, in government just sounds completely boring to me um, but it, and, and horrible. But, you know, I, I, I see the issues here. And what I've had to do, um, LA County is a, re a relatively easy county, I think, to run. Um, so I, I had to turn in about uh, 20 valid signatures to petitions. So that petition basically people saying that they want to see me. Uh, on the ballot, so you have to get a signature. They're not necessarily voting for you or endorsing you. They're just saying that they want to see your name on the ballot. Uh, they say to get uh, about 40 because what happens is when you turn in 
uh, exactly 20 um, well, were not registered or something like that. So you just need 20 people in your county that are registered to vote to sign your petition. Um, after that, you got to pay a bunch of fines. Um, all together, uh, it's about $2,000 <laughs> just, just to file. And that's, that's for a supervisor race, yeah, just the, to get on the ballot for the primary? Yeah. So uh, you have to pay about <laughs> 700 and I don't know the exact prices, uh, about $700 and Sixty-eight dollars uh, for the actual filing fee, and that gets your name on the ballot. Uh, so technically, you can get away with just that filing fee, uh, and then you got to do a, a, a candidate statement. Um, the candidate statement, um, and for some reason, I, my district happens to be the most expensive district for some reason. Huh? <laughs> Although I wish I was running in a different district, I pay save myself a couple hundred bucks. But you know, uh, I think uh, the filing or the uh, candidate statement is I want to say six hundred dollars for English and another seven hundred dollars for Spanish. So it's even more expensive if you want to put the Spanish statement as well. Um, all together it equals a little over two thousand two grand. Um, you could probably I could probably drop the, the Spanish uh, statement. I don't think there's a lot of Spanish only speaking voters in, in my district, so I don't. I'm not really too worried about about having the, the Spanish uh, statement, but the uh, English and the statement, and also the filing fee are, are the two important ones. Um, and other than that, uh, you know, I think that's pretty standard. I will say the good thing about LA County is there, there's no no do, no donation limits, so someone can write me a check for thirty thousand um, dollars. I haven't received anything. I think the most I got was a hundred dollars, but you know, <laughs> if anyone's out there and wants to give Tyler a check for thirty thousand dollars, just go to tylerkuski.com. Tyler T Y L E R K U S K I E dot com, and you can just uh, put in your employer information, your name, and then give me give me however much money you want to give me. <laughs> Yeah, it, um, Tyler, I'm sure it'll take a dollar or 30000 And if, if you donate to my campaign, I will give you a pocket constitution. <laughs> there we go. Anybody who donates more, more than $17.76 will get a pocket constitution. Are you going to sign the pocket constitution? Um, put it in the comment section saying you want me to sign it, I'll sign it, but I'll leave it as is. <laughs> All right. All right. So, so that was this. Brandon, as Northern Area Coordinator and a past candidate yourself, I believe it was Congressional... Uh, what? It was Assembly District 4. Assembly District 4. God, I, you know, I always do it. So what is the th things the state is doing to help candidates like yourself or Tyler succeed? Um, well, one of the things that I'm really excited about now is um, we recently had Marcos Morales, who is the past chair of the Libertarian Party of Florida, move into San Diego. And he's helping us roll, in a, or roll out a project um, that he launched in Florida to great success. It's called Operation First Steps which is identifying um, local offices, kind of like low-hanging fruit, uh, because a lot of people either don't really know that those offices exist or not very many people are going to run for them or both um, and provide a little bit more competition in those particular cases. That way we can, we can try and get libertarians elected at the local office. That way hopefully Tyler and a few of his friends can get in El Dorado County and help turn things around. And then also at that same point in time, they're building political credit you know, if, if Tyler's elected supervisor and he serves for four years or eight years and then he wants to run for state assembly or state senate, then he has more credibility behind his name rather than just being some guy off yeah, the street. Yeah, I, I think, definitely think that, uh, and not just, you know, looking, foresighting for myself, but just anybody, uh, if you're ever going to have, we're ever going to have libertarians run for partisan office, it's much easier to just say they're already elected as a position. So when people go give you that the counter, I go, oh, libertarians never win. If, if they're already won a, a nonpartisan office, it gives you a lot more credibility than just some random person that wants to run for office. Well, and even even other nonpartisan elections too, it'll help if you if you've already been elected. Like we recently had um, Jeff Hewitt last year. He was the mayor, I want to say, of Cala Mesa, mm -hmm. and he was just elected to the board of supervisors in Riverside County. Which is amazing, but I think that one of the major things that helped his campaign was having already served as mayor and helping them out by reducing the costs of their fire department um, was a, a huge help to his campaign, already having that political credibility built up when he ran for Board of Supervisors. I actually I don't disagree, but I do want to add a caveat to that. We, we are in strange times, and we have people like AOC who is political nowhere, who comes in and knows how to promote themselves properly, can actually bridge those gaps. So it's not that I'm not disagreeing with you, because that is the easier way. You start small and you build your way up, and that is the traditional way to do it. But if you are a candidate with a specific message or a specific talent, you can go around. Yeah, and, and so, it, yeah, I mean, I think it's obviously true that what you can have, if you're a fringe 
uh, person like Trump and AOC who have no experience and, and they can jump, jump in. But they're keep in mind they're jumping into major parties, already jumping into a Republican or Democratic party that's already ma- established. Uh, a, a third party, whether it's the Libertarian Party or Green Party or anybody else, or even the Socialist Party, there, there's no credibility uh, from the party that's backing them. And so it makes it a lot difficult. Even you have to it, build it. And then what ha- ends up happening is, is like, People just say, oh, well, if your third party is a bunch of cra- crazy loons. Well, what happens when you have a crazy loon actually run for a major party? They go, well, I just like them. I don't know why. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think we have, and we it's, have. It's not as much of a novelty when it's us. <laughs> yeah. exactly. Well, and we have a problem. We have presidential candidates running around with boots on their head. And that's a, and, yeah, Vermin's a great guy. I would, I would have him watch my grandchildren, right? I would have no problem having him watch my grandchildren. But I'm not a fan of the optics of people walking around running for president with boots on their head. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, it's, he's a great human being. And I, and I, and I agree. <laughs> uh, he gave me a bumper sticker. I, I drove around his bumper sticker for a little while because I felt obligated once he gave me a bumper sticker. But <laughs> no, he's a great human being. <laughs> and he's actually quite articulate if you watch the, uh, the South Carolina <laughs> debates. But I agree. The optics associated with that can be yeah, it's, it's, harmful to your electability. Yeah, the world looks at optics. They see, you know, the 10, 15 second clips and they see the guy. Yep. And of course, and that's the guy that the, the media is going to promote. And we've already kind of seen that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah well, remember what happened to uh, our famous stripper going on, on the uh, Libertarian debates or the Libertarian uh, convention yeah. a few years ago? Oh. Well, in a sense, <laughs> yep. and, and now we, we, got, we got branded yeah, on C-SPAN, and all of a sudden now we're branded the party of, of uh, a crazy stripper guys. <laughs> yeah, the, the crazy stripper guy, and it's, it's was literally, what, two minutes out of the whole convention, and that's what we get labeled yeah. with. And so well, we and have to was, be... It was the same thing with Trump during the 2016 election, because you actually had more moderate Republicans that had a fairly good base, good financial support, even establishment support. And they got beaten out, and I think that part part of that was Trump was able to front the money for a substantial part of his own campaign, which I, I don't think any of us have the luxury of. But the other thing that you had going for him was that the media loved to give him negative attention, but which, it was still attention. Yeah, whose I mean, whose name are you seeing every time you turn on the TV over and over and over again? It's it's not necessarily good attention, but that's the name that you keep seeing. Yeah, and, and I think it also goes in with some psychology is. People love to uh, love what someone else they don't like hates. So when you see somebody yep. that you are annoyed of uh, hating somebody, then you'll then for some reason want to justify the why enemy you like of that my person. enemy is my friend. Yeah. yeah, I actually think Democrats don't understand how much of support for Trump is actually the the people don't, don't like Trump. They just hate Democrats. The way the Democrats have become at this stage, there's a huge and they just don't reflect. There's mm-hmm. no reflection. There's yeah. there's no <laughs> looking in the mirror and saying okay. They're voting for Trump. They don't really like him, so that means there's something wrong with us, right? It's, I have to look at that all the time. I say, look, people are voting. You know, this California is a mess, but people are still voting for the Democrats. We're doing something wrong. Well, right? and even even look at it within the context of uh, candidates like AOC or Ilhan Omar. They are very much not establishment favorites, and yet they continue to upset the establishment politics in areas that the Democrats, quite honestly, thought were safe. They were strongholds. Like you had, um, I want to say, Ilan Omar took a seat in Michigan, and AOC's was in Brooklyn. Those, those aren't necessarily areas where the Democrats would think that they were under siege, but especially AOC, she flipped a seat against an establishment dem and got into office in Congress, no less. So you're, you're seeing radicals able to present a message where people are just sick and tired of the status quo. It's it's interesting. Yeah, to see and, the and plus, you, but like I said, they're, they're backed by a major party, so I feel that people say, feel safe voting for a radical when they're backed by a major party versus voting for a radical when, when they're not backed by a major party. Well, I actually oh, think I, we have I, to be careful, especially when we talk about that Brooklyn district. That is an insanely blue district, and her her can her opponent fell asleep. He essentially didn't take her seriously, that's true. and she got all her people out. Oh yeah, and so there's. Her, she, she won that as much on strategy as she did on her personality or her position. Well, and honestly, just based on effort. Yeah, and that's she actually comes, pavement. And that comes down to us. You know, is that what we actually need to do? Is we just have to be better at what we do. We have a golden opportunity. Calif- the Democrats who run the state have completely destroyed it. So we've got a golden opportunity to come out here and make a you know people like Tyler to come out here and make a point and say, look, things are messed up. We need to. We can. We can help fix it. You know, we're not going to issue you know all kinds of promises that we. That we can't follow through on, but we can help make things better, and eventually we can. We can help we turn can, the ship around. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think, but the struggle that I, uh, that uh, any can is going to have is, is making realistic promises versus making promises that stand out. 
So, I, I mean, yeah. a lot of promises that, that are realistic are like, okay, cool, yeah, thanks, please do that. But when you say a very outrageous thing, then you're like, oh, well, that's kind of crazy, but yeah, I'm going to vote for them. It won't, there's no way in, 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 on earth they'll, they'll be able to keep that promise. But Yeah, we always see that from the, you know, whether it's Democrats or Republicans today running for, pres or for president, they're promising everything under the sun. We'll give a thousand bucks, we'll free health care. <laughs> you know, is is there anything college. they haven't promised at this point? We all will... We'll, we'll, We'll kick everybody out. Uh, we'll yeah. kick everybody out. We'll, we'll pay off your student loans. We'll let everybody in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, no. We'll silence the people you don't want to hear. We'll, we'll give extra voice to the people you do want. It's, it's all over the yeah. place. And so we've, I think we've got an opportunity. Us as libertarians, we have an opportunity. But you know, part of that opportunity is we actually have to discuss, like, there's an assault on the Electoral College. You know, and I was actually watching a Dave Rubin video the other day, and she had he had an electoral college expert on, mm -hmm. and she was talking about that states like California might want to think about going to an electoral college system to elect your governor, so that the people in like the state of Jefferson, you know, we have got half the state essentially wants to secede, can actually get more representation, is where the rural areas get protected from the the, the city areas by a more balanced. Yeah, um, I mean, I don't really have too much of a thought on, on the electoral college. I, I did. I was nominated a few years ago to serve, uh, if for some weird reason, that Gary Johnson would would, would get a majority vote in California. Uh, oh, you were an elector. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> um, but you know, the electoral college, uh, it, it's it's kind of hard to define what what the original intent was because the one argument is that uh, at the time when we we started electoral college, it was more or less meant for. Um, which is at the, at the, 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 at the, for, sorry, protecting the accuracy of the vote. So at, at the time it was your paper, paper ballots, people had to count it, tally it up and it had to deliver it. And there's a lot of times where things would be delivered and not actually be delivered. Uh, and so there was, it was no, it was pretty difficult to, to tally up this many millions of votes across 13 colonies. And so having an elector to, to then decide how many votes there were and then going forward and say was a lot easier. Uh, and it was just a way to protect how democracy was formed. I don't. Uh, today we kind of use it to kind of protect the minorities. Um, well, actually, that's it's original design. If you if you go back into the the founding fathers, the, the, there was all kinds of different decisions. You had, you had people wanted to do the strict vote, like we kind of do now, like people wanted to. The other people who wanted Congress to elect the president and mm -hmm. have no, you know, the, the public have no no say in it in at all. So what they did is they sent the co uh, committee for unfinished business. Mm -hmm. And he sent this committee come in, go figure out this. And they came back with this electoral college. I think James Madison, I think he said, they came back with the electoral college. And what it was designed to do, remember at the time, that it was only uh, essentially white landowners that could vote. It was any landowner could vote, but it only white people owned most of the land. There was a handful of, of, of minority voters. But yeah. this is, it was essentially white landowners. And so most of the voting population was actually rural. And so the, and so the electoral college was actually used to protect the cities from being controlled from by the rural population. And as times have changed now, we've now actually gotten to the point where now cities are more popular than rules, and now the cities want to do away with their electoral college, do away with the protections they enjoyed for 200 years. It, it, it's a complicated thing, and I just, we don't, shouldn't be messing with it. I think these, these old men back there knew, it, knew what they were doing on this particular case. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, anytime you change, you change something that's been around for, for so long, it, it, you're gonna run into a, a headache of problems, regardless of, well, if the Electoral College is doing good or bad, if by eliminating it, you're going to run into a huge mess of things. Right. Well, I, I well think especially, I mean, you already have the state of Jefferson portion of California wanting to secede for, among other things, what they feel is a massive uh, lack of representation in government. But I, I think that you would see mass secession from the United States that we haven't seen since the 1850s, 60s if you were to suddenly say that essentially five cities are now running the country by electing the president via popular vote. Mm -hmm. I, I think that that's one of the main concerns that a lot of the less populated states are going to have, especially as more states are now adopting uh, legislation at the state level that guarantee all of the electoral votes in the state go to whoever got the highest popular vote. So it's it's interesting to see how it goes. Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting to play out. as. As the, I think her name is Tara Ross on the Rubin Report, as her, the, she said, she says, right. it's a, it says the, the electoral college is a bad system, but it's better than any other system they can come up with. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and we, we kind of seen that a lot here in the that United States. Like we, we, you know, we've, we've come up with a lot of systems that are bad, but they're better than the alternatives. You know, you can't always do what we like to do. 
So I guess one of the questions when it comes to candidates is there's a question is uh, what is livability? There was a ish, there was a discussion in Sacramento about you know turning you know what is livability and they're taking like Broadway they're taking it from a four lane commuter street they want to change it to a two lane residential street mm -hmm. and shove all the traffic off to somewhere to <clears throat> for livability reasons you know and what kind of yeah. well, how do we define that so. I mean, I know in LA County that we have a lot of uh, huge uh, NIMBY population. Um, m myself, personally, I'm not not uh, what, quite so anti-development as a lot of those people. My, my best friend is definitely NIMBY. Uh, not in my backyard, if you don't know the term. term. Um, but yeah, you, you do have to take account if, when you're expanding. Um, you can't just, just build and, ex and expect things to uh, be, be safe. I mean, you have to build things slowly. You have to make sure that you have equal amount of... Um, residential as commercial you can't have things lopsided so you can't you can't just build all commercial and it's the problem is a lot of developers want to just build uh, uh, residential um, we have to have both commercial and residential if you're going to build otherwise you're going to have complete chaos and you have to be able to expand the roads and make sure that the water flow the water is, is also a really important thing um, having the, the proper amount of water irrigation and all that stuff so it's relatively complicated but you know well i in I, in, in sacramento they're doing all kinds of stuff that have made traffic worse deliberately make traffic worse to get people out of their cars and into and into alternative modes of transportation whether it's scooters or or buses or walking and but you know for those of us who are forced to drive our cars like you know I'm a gig worker I drive you know I live by my in my car and so it's made my life more difficult and you know a lot in my neighborhood there's a lot of uber drivers mm -hmm. and so it's made their lives more difficult and we don't get to actually see have much of a say you know, I know that when they do outreach, they do outreach to farmers markets and these kind of things where people like Uber drivers don't go. And yeah, no, I mean, we don't have any uh, Uber drivers in LA County. I mean, uh, I, I think I went to the bar the other day from my house, which my bar, the bar from my house is, is probably not even five minutes away. If I needed to, I could walk home. Uh, the Uber driver called me and said, like, well, how far is that bar? They were felt uncomfortable driving me like, well, it's just five minutes. And it's like, okay, well, I'm not familiar with the area. Uber drivers, we don't have a lot of the population, so we all always have an issue with, with getting an Uber or, or Lyft or whoever to come out and pick me up in places and stuff. <laughs> well, you guys, yeah, you guys are far out there, and <coughs> and nowadays with the AB five has been a, put a big hurting on the Uber drivers. They're avoiding dead dead miles as like the plague now, so they don't want to have to drive all the way out there and then have to drive all the way back without a passenger. Yeah, and you know, it used to be it was it was easier to do, but now they put so much. Of, scrunch on is where they're avoiding that kind of thing like the plague and it's all going to go to in a handbasket which is actually what are you going to what would as a supervisor what would you do about this assault on gig workers i mean I, it's a state rule and, and and i don't know how much counties can actually do about it but it's not just uber I mean, and lyft drivers it's we can do uh sanctuary laws everybody else is doing it <laughs> i mean it's, sanctuary on capitalism <laughs> yeah i mean it's it's Freelance riders. I mean, she pretty much probably have a, a I, large number. Of I mean, honestly, when it comes to like unconstitutional laws that are being enforced, it's really about working with the sheriff's department. Um, I know De Agostini, our sheriff, is a constitutional sheriff, uh, and, and he's uh, advocated to not enforce a lot of new new uh, gun regulations that California has passed, uh, just simply because they're not only are they unconstitutional, but they're, they're virtually impossible to enforce. Um, now, obviously, he's within reason. He's not not breaking the law uh, as as an elected uh, sheriff. But you know, he, this is some working with somebody like that who's already in office, uh, working with the sheriff's department, uh, and saying, "Hey, don't enforce unconstitutional laws." I mean, get, get, I think that we can do is we can write uh, a law that gives officers um, a, more a, discretion. A, a, yeah, basically, if they don't feel that uh, if they feel that they're breaking the constitution by by making an arrest. Uh, make it so the officer can't be punished for not for not arresting them. Uh, and obviously, if somebody's hurting somebody, we still need to make sure the officer is arrest somebody. Uh, you know, if it, like an assault or something like that. Yeah, a victim sure crime, that, crime with a victim. You know, if, if there's a so yeah, if, if there's a victim, violent, you, you have, have to make an arrest. But if there's no victim, let the officers have a discretion, have the ability to uh, to not make an arrest. Let, let them have that luxury and freedom. I think it's simple. You don't even have to really change the laws. Really, you're just basically let, letting the officers be kind people. Um, well, and I think that that's a very important issue because, I, in my opinion, we've what's the word I'm looking for? We've we've kind of perverted law, or we've we've turned them into law enforcement. Whereas in in times past, they had been peacekeepers. Now we have them policing for profit, meeting quotas, and <coughs> enforcing laws that have no business in the constitutional republic that we're supposed to live in. 
I, I think that it, w it would be great to see more nullification at the county and city level by hopefully elected supervisors like yourself mm -hmm. passing ordinances that can help cut down on that and actually get them back to the identity that they were supposed to have within their communities. Yeah, I've actually long argued that the job of a, of a peace officer is to use the law to maintain peace in your community. A, a law enforcement officer, his job is to blindly enforce the law. Those are two actually vastly different jobs. And we're asking, you know, we're asking peace officers to find this balance when we actually haven't decided that balance amongst ourselves. We need to have these conversations in our own communities, amongst our own supervisors or representatives, that, you know, what do we want to do? This punishment society we've become in, we, everything, we, we solve every solution with a punishment, right? I, we want to have people get out of their cars, so we're going to make economic pain so you get out of your car. If you park your scooter badly, we're going to charge you 200 bucks on a, on a parking ticket, right? Or park our bicycle. It's what we do here in Sacramento now. If you park your e-scooter. Oh, I know. I always get tickets wherever I go to Sacramento. I hate driving down to Sacramento. <laughs> I always get a ticket. And, and usually I'm in the right way. I remember I, I, I parked. I followed the rules. I took pictures. I had all the evidence. But I, it was like, to go down here and fight this, I, it wasn't even worth the 45 bucks or whatever. It was just like like petty tickets, these, these small things. That, yeah. It, and I think what it, what it is is they just give you a ticket hoping that you won't fight a few of them because they're just so petty. Yeah, oh, I once literally got a ticket because my car was one, I had one tire one inch on the sidewalk. And I got a ticket for being parked on the sidewalk. I had sent my thing in to fight it, but you know, at, at what point it becomes pointless to fight it, right? Yeah, Just I think I, think I had the 50 within bucks one week, I had off. like three tickets. I fought the first two, and the, the, I, I got third one. I was like, you know what? Just, just take the money. I was like, it was just easier to pay the money. Yeah, there becomes a point where, where it's your, your cost. You've actually causing more time and aggravation. Your own time has a cost, right? Your yeah, time. just to fight the tickets, right? At, 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 what is, at minimum, I pay 20 bucks an hour, at absolutely minimum, right? If it takes me two hours to, to fight the ticket, well, I might as well just pay the stupid ticket. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right? All right. And that is about all the time we have. We've got, so I'd like to thank our guests, Brandon and Tyler, for showing up. You can get for more information for Tyler at your website, which is? TylerKuski.com. All right. Thank you for that. And for more information on the topics we discuss, you can go to our website, LibertarianCounterpoint.com. We have links to any stories we use. If you are watching us on YouTube, please hit that like and subscribe button. And if you'd like the notification button so you know when our videos come live, you can start looking for us on your favorite social media platform. And from all of us here at Libertarian Counterpoint, thank you for watching. And please remember, love everybody.